All right. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Focus on Fathers 2.0. My name is Paige Tucker, and above me is... Genevieve O'Donoghue. <laughs> and we are... Um, we are part of the Pinellas County Fatherhood Collaborative, which is a an collaborative among, that consists of many different organizations who exist to ensure that um, we are part more, to, to ensure to ensure that fathers are more included in our society. So we have a more inclusive society of fathers. Sorry, I'm bumbling all over the place today. It's Friday, guys. Uh, and so uh, Genevieve works with Operation PAR, who has spearheaded Focus on Fathers, and it's uh, integral for the reason why the collaborative or any of this exists as a whole. And, um, and so Genevieve, can you give a little bit more of why this matters to you, why you brought this, why is Operation PAR doing this event? And um, where where's your heart? Okay, so um, initially, uh, oh, about six or seven years ago, um, my director, my vice president of uh, our parenting education program at the time, brought to us the Nurturing Fathers yeah. curriculum. And initially yeah. when she brought that to us, I kind of was hesitant um, yeah. because of the lack of relationship with my own father. Yeah. And I... Not that I didn't think it was important, but at the time, I didn't really have buy-in. And as I grew as a professional, as I grew personally, as I became a parent myself, I just wanted to do more because I felt like fathers should have more of a voice. And so does my daughter, apparently. <laughs> um, and so I, I just... I mean, I've just always been passionate that um, men have a, a bigger role in their children's lives. And so as I learned more about the curriculum, I felt like we see a lot of activities and events for mothers and for families, but nothing specific to fathers. And I started planning and prepping and putting stuff together. And then I was introduced to the collaborative. I was introduced to um, a bunch of other organizations that wanted to push fathers. And so with that being said, I um, brought this to them and we took it and ran with it. We had a very successful event last year um, in person um, because we were unable to do that uh, this year. Went ahead and um, decided to go virtual. Absolutely. So we are here today to guide, guide, give the men an opportunity to talk. All right. And with that, I'm going to introduce our moderator, uh, Mr. Justin McLean, who has just been sitting there just waiting on us to get started. So Justin McLean is a LCSW. He currently serves as co-owner and licensed therapist at Home Again Counseling in downtown St. Petersburg. Justin guides his clients through the unwanted feelings of anxiety, depression, or anger toward an internal place of relief. Justin is specially trained in counseling individuals through recent and past traumas. Justin has years of experience working with children and adults involved in the foster care system and the public school system. He attained his master's from the Florida State University, his bachelor's from the University of Central Florida. Justin is a, is a community advocate and currently serves on the board of directors at CASA. And welcome, Justin. Thank you, Paige. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm super excited. So with that, we will um, meet our panelists. So let's start to get them on camera. Okay, am I missing somebody? Oh, there we go. Y'all excuse us, technology. We're just getting everybody on. Okay, here we go. All right, we have everyone on. The floor is yours, Justin. Okay. Oh, <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us today and happy Friday. Um, I'm glad that we're getting ready to start the weekend. 
Um, so I wanted to let our panelists uh, introduce themselves. Um, so of course, Zoom is all, it's different on everybody's uh, screen. I'm gonna call on uh, people to introduce themselves, our panelists. Uh, so we'll start with Marvin. Um, all right. Well, good afternoon. My name is Marvin Coleman. I'm uh, Vice President of Legislative and Community Affairs for Operation PAR and also a father of five. Mm. Wow. Wonderful. Wow. <laughs> Next, we'll transition to uh, Chris, Christopher. Well, my name is Chris Lampley. Uh, I am a father of three. I have a 23-year-old a, a that will be 24 in August. I have a 11-year-old, and I also have a one-year-old that just turned one in May. Um, so I have a wide gap between uh, my <laughs> and all three boys. Um, I, work, I also work for as well for Operation PAR as a prevention specialist. Um, here at the uh, Obi Land Center, and I also work for the City of St. Petersburg as a um, center director at Gladden Park Recreation Center. Thank you. Freddie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great to be here. Uh, I'm Dr. Freddie Manaya. I uh, practice at Hood Chiropractic. Uh, my wife and I have been married uh, going on 13 years now. We've had a total of four daughters. Uh, our first one passed at an early age when she was an infant with a terminal illness. Uh, God has since blessed us with three more beautiful girls. They're eight, six, and one. Uh, and if you're wondering, we're, we are done trying with the boy. <laughs> I'm, offi I'm officially a girl dad. Aw, girl dad. Okay. Thank you. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Love um, it. Wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you. Uh, we'll go into uh, Derek. Uh, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here. My name is Derek Fazell, a United States military veteran. I'm a father of three. My oldest will be 20. And I just found out I'm about to be a grandfather soon. I have a nine-year-old, soon to be 10. And the new addition is my son, soon to be two. Thank you. So our last panelist, I I'm actually going to um, introduce him. Um, He's uh, Mr. LaGuardia Cross. He's been sharing the comedy of life as a dad since 2014. He's the creator of the web series, New Father Chronicles, and co-creator of Two Daughters. Professional baby translator, videographer, writer, editor, actor, musician, and a proficient nap taker. <laughs> he's mom's, he's mom's 2.0 parenting vlogger of the year, 2017 and one of Ebony's Power 100. With well over half a million followers on social media and 60 plus million views on YouTube alone, viewers have been seeing his daughters grow up in real time and witnessed his growth and occasional ungrowth as a father. New Father Chronicles has been covered by Huffington Post, BuzzFeed, Today, PopSugar, and Parents.com to name a few. New Father's Chronicles is just the beginning of LaGuardia Cross's unique and growing brand of family entertainment. Thank you, thank man. You. There's nothing else to say. That, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes. No, that's, that's great. Like, I don't feel, uh, I mean, I'm hearing you all with five kids, kids that are half my age. So I'm, I'm really just here to learn. I'm here to learn. My girls are only five and three. I still feel like I'm right in the beginning. So I'm looking forward to all the things I'm going to learn for you, from you gentlemen today. Yeah. So thank you. Um, so we'll start off, I'll start off with the first question to the, oh. All right, one second. So really quick before we move forward, we just want to take a snapshot. So if everybody can look at their camera, Paige will do the screenshot for us. Uh, Okay, I'm gonna have to just take a picture. Cause... Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right, everyone, smile, smile again, just to make sure. All right. Okay, so perfect. I will disappear. So yes, you guys we're going to disappear. If you have comments, post your comments, and we will address them um, during the Q and A session. All right, 
Thank you. Uh, so we'll, we'll go with the first question. Um, and we kind of touched on it a little bit. But what has been your experience being a father? And I'm going to present that question to the panel. And whoever wants to go first can go first. Well, I'll say I'll, I'll start first that being a father, uh, I mean, is definitely the most challenging yet rewarding experience that you will ever have. Um, I'm a father of, I have two boys, uh, one 23 and the other 17. And then I have three step children, two, two daughters, one 30 and the other is uh, 13 and a younger uh, boy who is 12. So I run the gambit in regard to being step parent as well as you know the original OG father. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so again, I, the the experience has been rewarding on on both ends. Very challenging, yet rewarding. I would say for myself, um, you often when when you start to grow up as a young man, you wonder and ask yourself, how would you be as a father? Would you do the same things that your father did with you? Would you do the same thing? You know, your mother, the different traits. And, you know, I don't know if any other gentleman on the panel, I would say, man, I never do that same stuff my mom or my dad did. And I find myself doing the same thing my mom and dad did because it works. Um, but you have to add a twist to it. Uh, and, as, and as Marvin said, I mean, I, I mean my oldest is, is 23, about to be 24. Um, and I raised him. Um, I basically um, gained custody of, of my son once I graduated from college when he was six months old. So... Um, I've had, you know, he's been with me um, since that time. And, and during that time, um, now, I'm a, you know, I have a fiance and, you know, with her son um, and our son, you know, I, I just, I just inclusive of everybody um, being with me. And then my, and then the son we birthed together um, is just a different time. You know, as, as you get older, you're like, oh man, you know, what am I to do with all these different things that, that's, that's out there? But I always refrain back to what, what I was taught to myself as a son, because those values and those those life lessons, they don't change. Um, it, 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 it kind of enhance, get enhanced because you have to teach your children a lot more than what I was taught. But those same values and all the things that's going on in society, you still have to teach them those same ways because that stuff is not going to go away. Um, it, just, it just gets a little harder um, than it was when I was first growing up and first trying to raise my sons. Um, so with my youngest son I have right now, it, it, I, I just, I think back and, and think, what am I going to do? And, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to revert back to some of those things I did with my oldest son. And I'm definitely going to revert back to some of the different avenues that my parents have instilled in me because they worked. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if, it, if it was something that didn't work for my, for my sons, then I don't do it. I try my own thing. But you still going to have to try what, what you are accustomed to doing. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and just keep going from there. And to comment um, on what the brother just spoke about, now – He's raising his son. I'm raising my son. But at the same time, I have girls. So it, it's a little different where the parenting style, uh, like you said before, how mama raised you and how if you had your dad in your life, how would your dad raise you? But for me, it's a joy because I get to see the different personalities um, and the little people that I created. Hmm. So I can see me in them, but it's my job as a father to first to teach them to be the, the guide, the spiritual leader, then to teach my kids, okay, this is what needs to be done. Okay, we're not going to do it like this. We're going to do it like this. And I have a great relationship with my kids, um, very open, and just being dad. I mean, I, I would say that uh, for me, it has been, it's been an eye-opening experience because it forces me to look at my many, many flaws, mm. right? Like it is the biggest push towards leadership I've ever had in my life. It's showing me how petty I can be, how there are certain rules that make sense, but certain things I'll do just because I want it to be done a certain way. It has made me have to apologize to a human being that is over 30 years younger than me. It has made me have to admit my, <laughs> my mistakes in front of them. It has made me have to say, uh, you know what, that, that actually does make sense. It has made me have to have conversations with my wife, looking at my techniques, those same things of like, do it what my parents did, 
but then also having times where I'm just reacting out of anger or am I being too soft? Am I being too this? Just all the things that I wasn't really ready for uh, that came in and it's, and it's making me grow. So it's like I'm teaching them and I'm learning at the same time. I didn't know that this would take me back to school, but here I am in kindergarten all over again. <laughs> LaGuardia, I agree with you 100%. Everything that all of you guys are saying, um, being a father is by far the hardest job I've ever had to do and by far the most rewarding that I've ever had to do. And I'm, and I'm thankful for it because like you're saying, LaGuardia, um, I've learned how to be humble. I've learned how to, I've had those same challenges, apologizing to a child that, uh, that is two years in this world, but teaching them how to be humble, how to admit your failures, how to admit when you're wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful for, for them because in the process of being a father to them, it's making me a better man, a better human being, a better leader in every area. Right. So, so that would go on to my next question because all you gentlemen brought up, you know, the, the rewarding aspects of fatherhood and then also the challenges. Um, what is one of the biggest re rewards that you guys have had um, as being a father? I would say for myself is um, kind of uh, experiencing life through their eyes. I was just telling a story about my, uh, my oldest son at 20, 23, he's 23 now. And, uh, and one of the things is they, that they're always your children, no matter how, forget about that when they get 18 thing, forget about right. that. They're always right. your kid. I just, yeah. my son got into an accident yesterday and I just dropped him off before I came here. So he, 23, they're always your kid. Yeah. But, uh, but I was relaying the story about um, when my son was two years old and we were living in Atlanta at the time, but we had come back home to Florida, which is where we are now. And we had taken him to the beach for the first time. And uh, once we got past the dunes and the parking lot and got out onto the sand where the beach was and he saw the water, he flipped out. He started screaming at the top of his voice. He's got his hands on his head, he's pointing. <laughs> He, he's just, I mean, I had taken, growing up in Florida, you take the beach so for granted, but to watch him see it for the first time and to see how he responded to it was just an amazing, rewarding thing because it will cause you to slow down and really take a closer look at the things you take for granted every day. Uh, I, I'll jump in and, and uh, I'll add to that and say one of the most rewarding things for me is when uh, we all have those things where you notice in your in your kids uh, probably one of their biggest weaknesses and the toughest lessons for them to learn. Um, but the moment where they get it and they they see a positive outcome from their obedience or from them finally learning the lesson and seeing their reaction to just man dad was right not because we're not because I'm being justified not because I'm right but just seeing the look and the smile on their face of man I did this the way that I was told and here's a positive outcome and then seeing them do that day in and day out it's one of the most rewarding things because most of the time those toughest lessons we maybe I just speak for me I think for most of us I'd rather not have to I'd rather just ignore that I'd rather just go around that issue because you know as hard as it is for them to receive it and learn it, it's hard for me to have to teach it to you and talk to you about it every single day, multiple times a day. But seeing that point where it clicks and then they get, they see the positive outcome and the why dad's been on me about this, that is one of the, been one of the most rewarding things for me. I would echo that, especially when it's something that you have either suffered with, mistakes you've made in the past, or trying to keep Great them point. on the same track. So when they get it early, or they don't have to step through those doors you step through, you're like, yes, that's it. Well All said. right, let's keep moving. I mean, just just knowing that when you were talking and they were looking at you with that face, like, you know, <laughs> it, it actually clicked. You know, say, I mean, I got to see that face again. It's just for <laughs> <laughs> me that you know. I'm talking to them, looking at you, they're looking at you like, I don't know what you're talking about, Daddy, and you just need to stop talking. But as you say, as they gotten older, you they, they can come back to me and say, you know, I appreciate you telling me this or that. I appreciate you, you know, being there for me, you know. And, and, and we do it because that's our responsibility, you know what I'm saying? I mean, lot, lots of times, 
you know, dads or fathers that's here that, you know, they think that, you know, you get age, I only do something till you're 18. No, it's for life. You know what I'm saying? So um, you appreciate that time when, when you're just in normal and you're, you know, I say for my son, cause it just happened a few months back. He came to me, you know, I really do appreciate the way you, the way you dealt with me, you know what I'm saying? Cause, cause he, now he sees it, you know what I'm saying? When he was younger, I, I would tell him, you're going to go through some things that, you know, that you're not going to be prepared for, but these are the ways that you're going to have to prepare yourself. And you look at me like, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, but now as he's old, you know, getting older, he's just 23 right now, but as he's getting older, he's like, man, you, you, you wasn't playing, you know what I'm saying? And, and he thanked me for, for that. So that's, that's a reward of, of myself because, you know, we, we can only give them the tools, you know, and, and if, when they go out and use those tools, that, that to me saying I did what I needed to do. Now it's time for you to take those tools, learn them, drive forward and, you know, and do for yourself because you can't, I can't live for you and you can't live for me. You got to do it for yourself now. So, and, and though that's a reward for myself. And I agree. Um, rewarding for me is watching my kids, you know, each have their own personality. And last weekend I was blessed to have all my kids together at one time. And I watched my oldest, you know, like I said, I'm about to be a grandfather. Uh, we talked about some issues and she says, Papa, I've been watching you. You've been raising me. You, you take care of my sister. Now you have custody of my brother. So my nine-year-old, she said, Daddy, I love you. Because um, she lives in Atlanta. And she was like, can you just do me one favor? I said, what's that? She said, can you take me fishing? Mm. So I took her fishing. And to watch her catch four fish back to back and I'm catching the suntan because <laughs> I'm my hook and throw it up. She has another fish, so I have to help her, and I taught her, and she's wearing her Buccaneers jersey, go Bucks, you know what I'm saying? Um, we had fun, and to watch my son just last night, because I'm teaching him potty training, and I'm when he went, boat. he was so excited. So I'm like, yay, Leo, yay, and he's so happy, and he fell asleep in my arms last night, and I posted something on Facebook. Here's my son resting in my arms safely and secure. What if we rest in our Heavenly Father, Jesus? Wow. And I didn't know I was going to get a lot of comments on that. Mm. And, wow, it's just the simple fact that we are the role models to our kids. So I get a lot of enjoyment out of my kids, and I wish I didn't make certain mistakes I did, but those mistakes are defining me who I am now. That's really good. Uh, something that was pretty recent is uh, my five-year-old is starting to get into that somewhat perfectionist phase of her life. So there was one day, like, she was – trying to brush her teeth a certain way. And then I was saying, uh, oh, you forgot to do this one part. And she got upset. She's like, I just, I just want to do things right. And then everything that you do is perfect. And I don't know why I can't do things. Per I was like, hold, hold on, hold on. I don't, I don't do anything. She's like, yes, you do. And when you, like, you're strong. And, and she's saying things, which, I mean, hearing compliments from your daughter, I, I did allow her to go on for a little bit <laughs> to told her that uh really i just went down a list of embarrassing mistakes i've made and things that i make now because like she sees that i've been trying to exercise she has no idea what i was doing when she was two but now she feels like i've been in fitness my whole life which is a lie and so i'll do stuff and she wants to be able to do the same things and so yeah i had to tell her yeah i've been at the gym I dropped the bar on my head. I did this. I fell back. I tried to do this. I couldn't lift this. And she's like, really? Are you like, she started to get ashamed of me as I was saying stuff, but it made her not feel so bent out of shape about herself. And that's still that I, I keep coming back around to that for myself because admitting my mistakes and my flaws is allowing her to not feel like a mistake or failing makes her and herself a failure. Like she can continue to try and she'll start to say things now that I thought she was ignoring for a long time. Like she'll, she'll say like, well, um, I didn't win this time, but there's always next time. I'm like, really? 
from the same girl that doesn't want to race me unless I let her beat me. Or, or like, it's, it's just like all these things that she'll be uh, focused on, but she is, she's seeing just in me being honest with her that she doesn't have to be uh, setting impossible standards for herself while still trying and doing her best. And I, I love to see that. Thank, thank you guys for, for sharing all that. That definitely filled my heart personally. Um, on the other side of it, what roadblocks have you guys encountered as being a father? I'm going to say there's a challenge with um, just, uh, especially now with technology being what it is. You know, I can, it, since, since I have children who are in a, you know, have a good space between them as well. You know, I remember with, with my older kids sitting down to dinner and how difficult it is to get kids at a table now with social media and everything else that they're doing. So some of the challenges is, is really uh, getting in front of them the way that you feel like you need to when you have the time because time is so challenging and, 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 there's, and they have schedules now. They have scheduled programming and school when that went totally online and, and all these other things that, you know, compete for time. So I, I find that time is very challenging now. It's a big challenge as a father to have that time in play. I want to jump in and just say uh, for myself is, is the um, educational, educationally wise, it, things are being taught a whole lot different um, to your children um, and in ways that um, you know, it makes it kind of difficult as, as a father and, ch and challenging as far as making sure that you can direct them the correct way because the terminology is, is so different now, you know, same thing with, <laughs> with, the, with the, something that you just, you just have to make sure that, you know, you either you teach it yourself or find that, that person that can help you out with that, um, which, you know, with my, well, my oldest, you know, I, I had to do a little bit of that, but it is really, really um different now with, with my youngest, my youngest that's 11. So um, education wise and making sure that my, myself as, you know, as a father, just making sure that, you know, I went to school and I graduated and we all, you know, went to college and everything. And we can talk all that, but now it's the difference of how they're being taught different items to make sure I'm, I keep up with those different, those different ways in order to make sure that I'm, I'm teaching the same way so they can learn the same way so they can get the same um, as, as all children. So that, that's, that's kind of the, with the challenge with me, so. I'll jump in and say that um, for me, one of the biggest challenges uh, early on was uh, the fact that I grew up without a dad. It was me and my little brother and, uh, and my mom raised us. And so uh, we started having kids as we started having my first child was born at 22. And so I'm basically a child <laughs> having a child. And so I'm trying to fill in this role as best as I, as I could emulate it as it was presented to be by my strong mom. Um, so early on made a lot of mistakes um, like we all have, but that was the biggest challenge for me. And God was just really kind and, and put men in my life to, to show me what it's like to be a father, uh, uh, how, how to raise men, how to raise daughters in my particular case, um, how to be a good husband. So that, that was one of the biggest obstacles for me is not having that emulated throughout my childhood, throughout my life, what it's like to be a good father. And I would say um, right now the biggest challenge for me is being a single father raising an infant or a toddler, um, especially when I was working. I'm unemployed now, looking for employment. So in a way, it kind of gives me time to spend with him, especially in daycare, going through the motions of the biting, and once again, potty training and to get him to that age where I'll be glad to get out of pull-ups and diapers. <laughs> get past that far. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, you know, working. And I give, and I salute all single mothers because this is not easy, trying to balance a full-time job, come home, take care of children, especially if you didn't cook your dinner the night before, you have to cook it, they're hungry. Now, oh man, I never thought in a million years this would be harder than what it is. But, um, you know, just getting my son on a routine 
and we're going with the flow. So it's getting a little easier. I think for, for me, it has been uh, admitting when I need help because for myself and throughout many points in my life, it's very easy for me to feel like I'll figure this stuff out myself. I'll do it myself. And, uh, and my wife has dealt with depression for the majority of her life. So there's been a lot of times where I've had to step in and be a different kind of parent and be also trying to look out for her and for the girls at the same time. And it's taken me a while to be like, let me uh, call the grandparents. Let me see, like, let me not just feel like I need to be a superhero and fix everything and do everything. That is still, even while I struggle to tell my kids, uh, don't be upset if you need help. It's okay to ask for help. Their daddy is still struggling with the same thing. So there was, uh, there was really a video I was a part of last week and somebody thought that I said I was going to counseling for myself and uh, they thought wrong because I don't. And so it kind of it kind of put me on the spot because I'll be the one advocating for my wife to seek help, go to a counselor, do whatever you need to do and blah, blah, blah. And then for me, I'll act like, well, as long as everybody else is fine, I'll be fine. So the big challenge is for me to uh, seek help and accept help when I need it and not pretend like everything's fine. We're, 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 we're groomed. I mean, if, if you want to talk about it from the day and age, I mean, we're groomed as men to just be that, that provider. So right. there's, there's lots of times that, um, and I can agree with you, there's lots of times you don't ask for help. Even for myself, you know, I got a situation going on right now with, with my air conditioning being, being out. Well, as a man, I, I, I need to take care of this. But at the same time, now I'm thinking, well, my fiance, and she said to me, you know, we got this thing, but in the back of my mind, like, no. Nah, <laughs> but then I think, no, nah, you say you're going to help. So so tonight, we will have this conversation because I'm going to really ask for some help because you know, <laughs> that ain't safe. So, I mean, I mean, so, I mean it, it, and, you know, it's even with her, you know, we, we've always been, the man has always been that person that, um, and, and, and some women as well, but you know, in this reflection, men has always been the one like, you need to go ahead and take care of that. And we don't ask for that help. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we got to take for granted for some of that times. I mean, I know for myself, I reached out uh, when I need help and sometimes I didn't. And sometimes I wish, man, I wish I went in to ask because folks can see it on, see it in you and see it on your face that, man, you know, he might need, <laughs> they don't approach you like that. You know, they wait for you. I'll be like, no, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, they squirt, no, I'm good, I got it, you know what I'm saying? And they back in mind, like, man, I should have went ahead and said, yeah, but you know, you're like, no, nah, I say nothing. So it's just that, it's just that pride within us, what makes us strong, or what makes us want to take care of things, because, like I say, you have some men that won't even try, you, you know what I'm saying, that would just say, oh, yeah, you can go ahead and do it, and they're, and they're not even trying. So, I, I mean, it's kind of a gift and a curse, you know, with, with men that really want to do what they need to do for their families, for themselves, you know, and everybody that's around you. So I, I, def I definitely do agree with that. It's, it's kind of like that's what the, the expectation as men, especially uh, as fathers, is that you're going to be okay, right? Yeah. And everything is going to be okay. And when you think about it at every, every piece of your life, a lot of times that's the expectation that you're going to be okay. And God forbid something happen, like the air conditioning or something go out. Right. There's an expectation that you have, as a man are going to take care of it, whether you go out there and pull it apart or whether you're going to call someone and be there when they get there. You know, right, right, uh, right. Th those are all the, the expectations. And, and those things can be really heavy as well, too. I mean, think about it as a father. Christmas come. Why you always got to open your presents last, right? <laughs> Everybody else goes first, you know what I mean? You, you last at that. Father's Day coming up, what you going to get? More underwear, ties, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mother's Day, you had to go break the bank on dinner. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Kids' birthday. So, so the expectation is, ah, dad will be all right, you know? Yeah. yeah. Very true. Thank you. Um, so I, I love this conversation. You know, I love, you know, challenging the idea of what we are as men and what we are as fathers. Um, and we are doing a lot. And I want to talk more about the day to day. How do dad, how, how do you as a dad help with your children on a daily basis? Ooh, I'm going to start with that one. Uh, <laughs> Take uh, it, Chris. <laughs> I, mean, I, I have a one-year-old. I mean, he just turned, um, 
just turned one uh, in May, May 20th. So, you, you, you know, when having my first son, it, like I said, I had him when he was six months old, and I was off in school, so I didn't, I didn't do a lot of the, the daily, you know, um, changing the diapers and, 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 you know, milk, you know, getting up in the middle of the night and milk. I, I made a point of myself when, when, when my son was being born that I had to be there to do these things. Um, it was a little struggle at the beginning because I was tired. I mean, I'm older now, so it's like, you know, just hopping up and, and going to work and trying to make sure I come back. So I've tried my best to adjust my whole schedule to ensure that I'm there at every step that, that he needs. Or, or if, if I'm not there at every step, he needs it like, well, listen, I can take him with me. You know what I'm saying? I, I try to make sure that it that is not left all on on my fiance, uh, my future wife, to, to take care of those items. And and, and I did the same thing with my old, my oldest, but you know I was younger younger then where I had my mom and aunties and everybody and say, well, listen, you go into their house, you know. But now as I'm older, I really don't want to do that. I really want to be the one to either either just stay home and, and do what I need to do, or take him with me, or 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 in essence, when I when I talk to my fiance, well, listen, I well, listen, you can go ahead. I just take him here and everything, and more find that medium ground because I have that that extra person that that basically can give me that assistance. Um, so it it, it just it's just finding find that balance to make sure I'm there. I mean, it, we're always there as dads, but but we need to be there also physically and mentally and emotionally and everything because we, right. we work and, like I said, we're supposed to take care of, of everything, but we still got to make sure we take care of the home and being there with our kids as well. So, Yeah. No, and I'm about that. Like, I'm not um, – there's no parts of it where I feel like it, – it's just – you know what will come to my mind is all the stereotypes of what dad used what dads used to do in the old days like grandparents uh -huh. and all of them and the woman does this role and the man like all that stuff is gone i've been changing diapers i've had <laughs> poop between my yes, fingers sir. i i'm learning how to plait and braid i get them ready i bathe them i take them to school i take them back i will read stories with them like it really is uh just trying to exchange and share time at home and to be able to be a balance. So with my, my wife here, it still comes to things where they would rather hug up and snuggle up and cuddle with mommy. And they will say that mommy is softer. I want to spend time. I want to do it with mommy. And you know? like, they'll say all of that stuff, but it's really a shared experience. And then they'll come to me and we can run around and sweat and play but it is, uh, it is, yeah, that is the day to day. It's, it's the hard, when will these kids go to bed stuff, <laughs> in bed to take their naps, coming in the room saying, stop talking to each other and finally go to sleep, turning off the baby monitor because I don't want to hear them talking because I'm napping when they nap. Like that's, that's <laughs> the day to day thing. I'm with you 100 percent, LaGuardia. Uh, be, being a father of three daughters, all of them have super long curly hair. Uh, we're, we're we're playing a zone defense, so it's it's two against three, and so I have to at least grab one head and learn how to do. So I've I've gotten really good with hair on the day to day. Um, and he, but and and that stuff is really more to help my wife. That's really not as meaningful to them. Like you're saying, Chris. Uh, you know, anywhere from 10 to 12 hours of work I'm putting in here at the office, uh, and then at the end of the day. I come in and it seems like it's a hero, like like I'm the hero at the end of the day and, and the kids have fun with me, but my wife does a majority of the stuff. Uh, she's been a rock star with the virtual school, uh, doing all that, her being a teacher herself and then me just being home, being at the office. But um, when it comes to the day to day, when it comes to meaningful things for my girls, um, I can't even say that this is something that I realized at the time, we just kind of developed into it, but I realized at some point that our evening routines are like super important to them. Uh, yeah. None of them go to sleep until we do our routine. And each of them have their own specific routine that I do with them, especially my one-year-old right now. She'll cry and scream all night long, literally, until I do this routine with them. Um, and so even though it may be 30 minutes to an hour that they have with dad, it's extremely meaningful. And so uh, getting into their world, getting into their room, sitting on the floor with them, looking at them at the eyes, uh, in their eyes and hearing their stories. And this for me has been really important, especially with my middle child. She's very much an expressive speaker and expects you to be an expressive listener. So, so if I'm just straight face listening, she's like, dad, are you listening? 
I'm like, honey, I'm here. I'm in your face. I'm making eye contact. What are you? And I realized she wants me to smile and nod. And whoa, wow, that's great, honey. He's totally into it. Yeah. <laughs> totally 100% into the story. And she will repeat the story until I show some, until I match her expression. Dang. So I, I've just realized that even if I only have 30 minutes with them in the whole day, if I'm just like you're saying, Chris, fully engaged, being an expressive listener in their world, listening to them about their day. Uh, just last night, I'm exhausted, and uh, and my and my second one says, uh, "Daddy, let me tell you about my day." She had gymnastics yesterday. Yesterday, let me tell you about my day. So I woke up. That's how she started. <laughs> so I woke up. Like, okay, here we go. Wow. <laughs> so I woke up, and Doe told me every single from summer wow. camp to home to gymnastics and the rope and the cartwheels, and I'm like, oh, I'm 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 in front of her like this. Like, I'm dozing <laughs> off, but but again, that time with her was probably 15 minutes out of what 20 hours or 16 hours in the day, but she loved it. It was meaningful. So for me, um, I wish I could help out with more of the day-to-day -day things with lunches and food and things like that. My wife would love it, but I'm here at the office. But for the kids, um, just having those those meaningful moments where you're in their world, those evening routines has been uh, valuable for my girls. Mm -hmm. so this is um we're gonna move a little bit um it's something that because there's a lot of chaos in the world um and, and things that are going on um and it's affected me personally um and i think it's probably affected all of us on this panel um with having kids how do you how do you go about having that conversation Kids. Well, you know, I, I was just having that uh, conversation again, you know, with, with my son about, you know, people, some people may feel like it's, it's just, it, it's just talk. It's, it's, you're saying you have to do that. But when I say as a father of African-American boys, to have to have that conversation, especially now, you know, once, um, you know, my boys, once they turned, um, about 14, 15, and they're pretty tall. And, you know, I, I really had to reinforce that interaction and that conversation with law enforcement and the respectful piece of it and the going above and beyond to seem less threatening and all of those different things, just because of the climate of, of, of what I know from the experience I have had with law enforcement. And my father was in law enforcement for 27 years. So, you know, just the experience that I had with that, trying to prepare them in the same way. Because, um, you know, as, as a minority, the world has changed a bit as well, too, for my boys in a sense of a desensitization. You know what I mean? We, they're desensitized even to an extent that color even still matters in certain circles. So even talking to them about that, look, I know you have friends who are, are multicultural and multicolor and multiracist and and, and live all over the world, it seems like now. Uh, and that's, that's all fine and well, but not everyone in the world sees it the way that you do. Right. And that, that false sense of, hey, I can do this, I can go here, I can, I can hang with these folks, uh, and just trying to have the conversation that, that's based in reality, which their world is not always based in reality, I think is, is a real challenge. But I've just found that you've had to have it. And even especially now, you know, my son uh, at, at 17, when he goes to hit the door, I get nervous every single time because like I said, he's a, he's a tall kid. He plays football. If you were to stop him with that little bit that's growing on his chin and on his lip right now, you know, you might mistake him for a, a grown man when he's, you know, just 17, just turned 17. So, you know, I, I get nervous every time he hits the door so I find myself overkilling and he has to shoo me off. Oh, dad, dad. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But um, I feel like that's my responsibility to kind of prepare him for what he might encounter. Mm. No, no, it's in their surroundings. I mean, that, I mean, and like I said, I, my 23 year old, I mean, my oldest, when I just, when it was just him, I always used to preach to him and like, know where you at, you know, just don't, just don't be aimlessly just going somewhere or going somewhere with friends and everything. And, and he used to be like, well, dad, do I have to tell you everywhere I'm going? Like, yes, I, I, I need to know because I need to know a start. If something happened, I need to have a starting point to say, well, he was supposed to be here or he was supposed to be there. And, and, and 
and and it gets to that point even for my for my middle middle son now is like when you go to ask those questions, why do people act like that? Or why do people do it? And you have to explain to them. I said, well, everybody can't be the same as what we do here. But this is, this is the way, you know, you, you have to be and grow up and how you need to treat people. But you can't fix that for everybody. They have to learn how to fix that within themselves with, and on their own. But when you're out and you're not around me or if you are around me, you see something going on, notice your surroundings, know what address you're at. No, I mean, don't, those small little things like that would, would keep you to know that you, you know what's going on. And, and you have to teach our, our young males that because they, they – if they just sit around and say and, and get mad because they, they see this going on on the news, well, what you get mad about? What do you know about it? You know, asking those, you really got to ask some of those questions because sometimes they just get mad because they think somebody else is mad. But what you're getting mad about, do you know what's really happening? You know, so you have to, you have to delve, jump into it that way as well because they can just be mad and upset because they heard somebody else say, this what happened. Well, you might have heard that, but what's your opinion on it? How do you feel about it? What do you know? Well, they say, well, I don't know anything. Well, you got to do your research. You got to find out what's going on first before you just automatically just want to take this side or that side. And, and, and a lot of things in society, I mean, it, it, it happens like that. And, and we're also, even in a situation that climate is going on, it's always we're put in this box of saying we're all, this is how most of your black men are. Your black men are just like this. But I mean, and, and and just to be honest, they're intimidated by us. I mean, I'm just gonna be I'll be honest. There, there's a lot of intimidation that goes in the fact that we are, you know, as men. I mean, regardless of color, we as men can do the same job, you know, the same work um, as good or better, you know, because as a man, regardless of the color. And it's really about teaching teaching our young men and our young ladies, you know, when they when they start as they start to grow up. You can do the same job. It doesn't make a difference who you are, but these are the struggles you're going to go through to do that job. These are the struggles you're going to go through in order to get that pay. But as long as you keep your keep everything straight, as long as you do what you need to do, you know, you, you're going to get recognized. It might take you a little longer, but you should get recognized eventually. So, And I'm only quiet because I'm in the beginning of it, right? Like, <laughs> I, I mean, five and three, like the oldest one is just about to start kindergarten in August. Right. So that's like just the beginning of seeing an expanded world. So I'm listening because all of these are conversations I'm going to have to prepare them for. Yeah. And, and the scary thing is, I, I, I even hate to ask this question, you know, because there is this pressure on us. Like, when do we when are we supposed to start having those conversations? I'm going to jump in there and just say you should have the conversations. I mean, you know, your your kids. So you'll you'll know based on the maturity level how to filter it. So that they understand and that you get the, the best impact. What I tell, what I say, especially to young fathers, is don't lose the intent of why you're doing a thing. Because some parents, mm -hmm. you know, in the beginning, especially I remember as a young kid, a young father, a young parent, um, and and when I married pretty young, and my my wife had a three year old daughter when we married, so I was instantly dad in that situation. And, um, and I can remember when she came home one day and she, she, um, she, I, I had IBC root beer, short story, IBC root beer in the refrigerator and those little brown bottles, it looked like beer, you know, she went back to school and told the, the kindergarten there that her dad was on drugs. Wow. <laughs> so because they had been talking to them in school about drugs and beer and showing them oh. what it looked like, right? So uh, I tried uh, when they sent this whole message home to me. Yes, uh, is there a problem that we that we need to talk about? I'm like, uh, no, there's not. But as I got to talk with her about it, and I asked her what did she know about it, she talked about, well, you take this stuff, you get sick, and then you die. Well, as a young father, when she told me that, I was like, yeah, that's right, absolutely. <laughs> as I started thinking about it, you know. She's going to have friends as she gets older who takes this stuff and they don't die. And now I've lost credibility, right? So now I had to go back and kind of really correct that and filter it through. And I say that, you know, our children are most protected most often around us. But when they start to go to school, I mean, I had my first experience really with a level of racism that I didn't understand in school at about kindergarten head start, right? Mm -hmm. So have those conversations early and filter them as they understand them and, and filter them in a way that your intent is involved with it. Because if you, if you're looking at my intent is to make them afraid, 
that's going to produce a certain thing. If my intent is to educate them and to support them and make them feel empowered, then your conversations and then the result is going to be that. So, so I recommend starting as early as possible, as early as they get away from you and around other people. And that could even be mm-hmm. around other family members as well, right. too. Right. You should be having conversations as early as possible. I like that. I'm thankful for what you're saying, Marvin. I'm, I'm listening and taking notes because uh, like LaGuardia, I'm, I'm still on the early age. I'm, I'm kind of in that. It's like I'm playing double Dutch. I'm trying to figure out like when should I jump in and say, and so when you're, when you're trying to figure, like for me, when I'm trying to discuss important things with my girls, I first try to listen to their conversations with their friends or with their, amongst themselves, their sisters, just to kind of see, do, do they pick up on anything where they're at with it? And, you know, with everything that's going on right now, I realize, like, like you said, uh, Chris, um, they don't realize what's going on. They have, they have black friends, they have white friends, they have Asian friends. Like, they don't see anything. So I'm thinking in my mind, like, do I want to create a problem in their mind? Like, do I want to bring this up and, like, burst their bubble? But uh, we have brought it up at least to the eight- and five-year-old, obviously. Uh, the six-year-old, she's going to be six in two weeks. Um, but we've brought it up, like, how you said, Chris, this is how some people in the world view this situation. But this is how we do it in this family. This is how God wants us to do it. This is what the Bible says. Um, but like, like we, we've tried the best that we, as, that the best that we could as early as we could, like you're saying, Marvin, um, to bring these issues up um, and, 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 and almost paint it like, not not to not to paint the world black and evil and red at the same time, but just kind of make them aware that stuff is going out there, so that if they happen to hear it, like you're saying, when when they're away from us, they can somewhere at some point say, "Oh, my mom and dad talked to us about talked to us about that. My dad talked to me about that." So um, that that's kind of how 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 we try to uh, handle difficult situations. And I thank you, fellas. I was just sitting back listening um, to how you guys react and explain to your kids. Um, I know some are still in the early stages, kind of like myself with Leo, because he's still a baby. However, I have to explain to him as he starts getting older, he is mixed, black and white. So I have to take upon myself and sit down because he looks more african-american okay with my daughters my 19 year old she's half african-american half french has a citizenship in paris so she goes back and forth and she sees different things on the other side of the world my nine-year-old um she's very sensitive so when i talk about certain things i have to be careful what i say because she is so easily to start crying and I'm just not ready for that part yet. Um, I haven't sat down and discussed what's going on in the world. Um, It's not the right time. I let her mom do that Um, because I'm a little rough around the edges. I believe I'll say something straightforward and then I don't want them to take it the wrong way. So I hear what you fellas are saying and I'm learning as well. And I want to reinforce that the kind of where this is headed to, um, because I kn- I know myself. You know, my father was the example that I had, and my father, great guy that he was, but not very engaged. That just like I say, he was in law enforcement for twenty some odd years. When he came home, he wanted to sit in that chair and take off those shoes and not be bothered by anyone. Right? I mean, that was kind of his mode. Was was the way way that he did things, and. Um, and it, it influenced my, the way that I parented uh, because I want to be the opposite of that and be really engaged and involved, uh, which I was. But that was a choice that I made. It was, it, was, it was happenstance. It wasn't something that someone said. That, like, I don't know of any books that, that you can sit down and say, hey, here it is. Or you're at church and a group of guys get together and say, all right, you're going to be a father someday. Let's talk to you about that. So even having this forum today, and listening to you guys and being able to contribute, I think is the critical thing that's missing for fathers today. What if there was something that took place every single month where there's this big 
you know, conference call or forum of fathers that you could get on and just talk about certain things. That's you know, awesome. women do right. stuff like that all the time. But us guys, we don't have right. no, we're flying by the seat of our pants <laughs> to come down to doing stuff, you know. That's the truth. That's true. Look, I barely have friends in real life. That's, that's, I, like, I, most of the men I talk to in my life, it is work related in some way. There was a guy who's also a dad. We were texting each other yesterday and he, he had to tell me like, you, you know, we could like be friends in real life. <laughs> I just had to catch myself and be like, yeah, we don't have to always talk about work. We could talk about other stuff. Right. And that, yeah, that's, we, we, yeah, yes. So Marvin brought up something interesting. Um, he talked about his experience with the root beer, with the school system, and also um, Head Start. So my beginning was, I've, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, so I, I, have, I do therapy now. But one of my first experiences was I worked in the child welfare system, right? And I worked in a school district. And as a young social worker, I even made mistakes like for instance and i see it all the time like at the school district when we would have to call a parent regarding a kid 90 percent of the time we would call mom mm -hmm. right and then even with my therapy side as a long, young therapist like if i had divorced parents <coughs> or separated parents and i would always engage with mom you know i would never even think of i need to go reach out to dad you know because he's a huge part of this equation for the wellness of their of the, of the kid. So my question is, have and it could be any type of the system, right? Have you guys, what's been your involvement with the system? And it's, it could be DCF, child support, WIC, government assistance, school, and how has your experience been? Well, I'm gonna start by saying, I, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying, uh, having uh, gone through a divorce and then having custody of my two boys before, you know, I remarried a few years ago. And, um, and just, you know, the school is active as I was, I was the dad who dropped the kid off in the morning and picked him up and was there for field trips. I was always that way. But they still always reached out to the mom, They still always reached out, you know, to her. And, uh, and, and that was was very difficult. And, and, and I will say, you know, the strange thing, and I think it's correcting a little bit now, but out of, out of all of the fathers that I knew who had children who had either gone through divorce or were never married to, uh, to the young lady that they had children with, I was one of very few fathers who actually had custody of their kids, and, and I was the anomaly. And the same thing in involvement, going into schools, I'd see tons of moms and very, very few dads in that process there. Um, so, so I was the anomaly in that. And the system handles you that way as well, too. You show up to things and they're like, oh, oh, okay. You know, it's, it's, a, it's not even a natural response that you get when you're involved. And there are not things that, that are, are designed to connect you up even to things. I mean, they have a have dinner, you know, they have a, bring your grandparents to breakfast at most schools, but nothing about bringing your fathers to, uh, to, to breakfast or anything like that. And fathers are oftentimes more removed than the grandparents are. So I think the system can do a lot better at, at all of those different levels with engaging fathers who want that opportunity. And I have to echo that because like I said, when I, when I, I had my son when he was six months old. So just being, being with me and being around and going everywhere from the laundry, you know, doing laundry, everybody, oh, that's just so cute. You able to just take your baby with you? Say, yeah, he's with me all the time, <laughs> you know? And people will really look at you strangely like, oh, you keep him? Yes, I 24-7, seven, seven days a week, he's with me. All. So, so the anomaly, like Marvin said, is like they, it, it, it's almost like they're surprised that we're able to rear and be with our kids other than just sports, you know, and other things. Yes, we're there for the sports. I mean, I was that sports dad. I coach, I coach football, basketball, and you know everything for years, and, and we're there. But it's, it, it, it just society with self and in the school and and then with child sport. I mean, when I was when I was younger and, and my uh, my son, I would you know ask his mom, "Hey, is you gonna help out with anything?" And you know, I ain't doing this, and I ain't doing that. All right, well, you know, and 
I guess I go and go and talk to these folks. And, and then when you go and talk in the office, say, oh, you're, are you getting information for your, for your wife or somebody else? No, I'm getting information. Oh. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, oh. so you're already getting that stigmatism. Like, what are you here for? Because <laughs> Steve, you're supposed to be the one that give. The right. give the oh, wow. I mean, I, I, I mean, I just sat there and looked at it later like, no, I'm going to get the paperwork for myself, you know? Right. So, and that was 20 some years ago. So, I mean, it's, you, you always get that because it's, it is a rarity to see that dad come and sit in the conferences, you know, and everything. You you usually only see mom because dad doesn't doesn't come. Um, and me growing up, I mean, I love my parents were together for, for over 50 years. My mom passed away a few months ago, but my dad didn't go to those things. My dad came to football games and everything. My dad didn't go to the conferences and the band things and all this stuff. My mom was at every single one of those. Nothing against my dad, but that's just from from here in that day and age. It was like that's what you, you you go to your mom or your mom supposed to do that, you know. So it's like as I you know I got older and I started having kids, I just realized that I had to be there. You know what I'm saying? Um, there was no reason for me not to be there. So I mean, I had I had to to be there. So and and we just, we just get labeled as as those folks that and that, that Marvin said they, you see me all the time. Drop him off. And I go in here to ask a question. Oh, would you like me to send that to Miss Lampley too? No, you just send it to me. I, I'll take it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I'll take it. And you just laugh it off, oh, you know what I'm saying? Because you know, like, like, why you got to send it to somebody else? I'm right here. You know, I'm not picking it up for her. I'm taking care of myself. So it is it's just like that. I mean, and and we're not the only dads that's on that's on this panel that maybe some of this has happened to. There's many dads out there that this has happened to, but it's yeah. it I just laugh. I mean, I just really laugh and just look at people like, nah, you know, I just I'm here. He's mine. You know, it's my responsibility. So I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, you know, so. And I'm glad you said that now. That's funny because <laughs> I was in the store with my son um, and I do have the WIC and WIC has been great. I learned something new about that. And I'm in the store and this couple said, oh, look at the baby with his granddaddy. I'm like, no. Uh, oh. <laughs> my son. Oh, they had to do that man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Uh, so, you know, it's just people are, they're not used to seeing certain things. And um, the system has, like you were saying about the child support, I had a caseworker call me. And he was like, are you the one with custody? I'm like, yes, I am. You called me. Uh, why may I help you? And he was like, okay, we're going to get your case moving forward, which is in progress as we speak. Um, just to learn some of these, you know, doctor's appointment about Medicaid. Yeah. I had no idea about any of those services until I got custody of my son, which was December 4th of 2019. So I'm still learning. Um, you know, if there's help out there, any other programs I need to know about, I'm, my ears are wide open. Definitely understand that. Well, I've definitely shown up for different, you know, court and, and you know, child support, things like that. And they think I'm the lawyer. And it's like, no, I'm uh -huh. the father who <laughs> needs that help. And, I, and, and to that regard, um, you know, the family law system, as well as a lot of these other systems as a whole, are, are really designed to exclude and to keep fathers yeah. out of the lives of their children. And when you look at them at every level, you know, you could have a child with someone, you guys are not married, you know, they're on section eight and it limits your ability even to be with your child just based on what those standards say. Um, you could be in a situation to where, you know, you're, um, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to be involved in your child's life um, and, and you're trying to, to do what you can, spend time with them during the week as well as on the weekends if there's a custody issue. But because of the way child support is structured, there's no absolute no way that you can spend that level of time with your children and afford to do that and mm. take care of yourself as well too. Right. So the family law system is designed basically to exclude fathers from the scenario. And I say that from uh, in my own father, after my mother and father divorced, my, my mother and father had five children. When they were divorced, my father basically worked to pay child support. He had a roommate that, that he lived with up until I was probably 15 years old or so, because that's what he needed in order to be able to take care of himself. And he, and, and he didn't really come around a lot. And these are conversations we've had 
of course, since my father is probably one of my best friends um, now because we, we, we really just had an opportunity to really grow through it. But, you know, he talked about, you know, hey, OK, so I come to visit you guys and pick you up, all five of you. And what are you going to want? Let's go get something to eat. McDonald's, Burger King, things like that. And I've got twenty dollars in my pocket to eat on until the next pay period, you know. So right. the system as a whole oftentimes is designed to exclude the father. And it's going to take mothers to help correct that situation as well. Yeah. Those have been my experiences as, uh, as with, with our first daughter when she was first born with the, um, with her illness. Uh, we, we dealt, you know, we were tw uh, 20, 22 at the time, early twenties. And so we're new to the whole, like, like you, Derek, we're new to Medicaid at the time. We're, we're new to services. And so we're showing up to the health department because they want to do regular checkups on her. And, you know, first of all, I'm like the only guy in the whole building outside of, you know, it, with regard to people needing services. And when, and when they acknowledge me, it's like, oh, are you the boyfriend? Uh, no, I'm, ac I'm actually the husband. Figure that out. Like, we're actually <laughs> married. And, and it's like you're saying, there's a, oh, okay, well, here's a seat. Surprise. Technology difficulty. No, see, they didn't like that. They didn't like yeah, right? <laughs> that. Yeah, right? The conspiracy was trying to shut him out again. Just like what he was saying, they blocked him. Same. same as my wife's, we're, we're, we're a unit here. We're together. Uh, we had services. There was a time frame where my wife was the uh, the only one working, and I was a stay-at-home dad. I was, try I, I was just fresh out of college, and I was trying to find work for a year before I went to, uh, to chiropractic school. And I was a stay-at-home dad for a year. And so all of the, uh, the PT, the OT, the, the physical therapist that would come to the house, first couple of times they'd met me, they're like, where's mom? She's at work. I'm dad. Nice to meet you. I'm Fred. Yeah. They don't want this message to get out. No, me. they don't. <laughs> they don't want to get out. <laughs> like <Lacking> that. <laughs> I'm really wanting to hear this. <laughs> you know, right? Uh, in the child's <laughs> life, uh, but we're we're here, and, and I agree 100 percent with what you're saying, Marvin. It's going to take a lot more of uh, of mom saying, "Hey, reach out to the husband, or he can be here." Or I don't I don't know what it is, but inviting the father in, into the conversation, I think that's going to help a lot too. And it's going to help. It, it has first of all, it has to start with us, right? We have to right. Right. show that we want to be there. Right. And that's what I think is so good about now that there's so many examples of that now. It can't be an oddity for, for that long. Even though my preschool, uh, the girls' preschool, only sends emails to mommy and usually will only call her first. Like, I don't have technology on me. <laughs> it's just good that they're seeing us out there and engaged to where it's undeniable now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brings me to my next question. So here's an, uh, there's a lot of folks listening to this, right? And we're recording this, so if anybody will listen to it in the future, how what would you guys say? Like, how will the vendors, agencies, and even this collaborative that put this together do a do better for fathers to receive services and help in the community? How can they improve that? Well, I'll go first uh, because I was um, attending the. Um, the classes with Mary and Lee. Um, you guys are great. You guys are great. I love everything at first. When I first entered, I'm like, man, why do I have to take this? You know, the court made me take it in order to get custody of my son. And then when I listen to the other the father's stories, I'm like, you know what? What I'm going through is not as bad as what someone else is going through. So I start interacting with the men. I start sharing my stories and start letting God just use me and speak to them because I have kids. I'm here because I'm getting custody of my other child. And I start having fun. And that led me to this opportunity, which I'm so grateful to even be speaking with you guys. Um, you know, any way I can help men, I encourage them seek, okay, the programs out there. You know, don't be afraid to ask for help, okay, because mothers get it. 
Right. But as men, we can sometimes be so prideful. You know, we have to put that pride to the side and say, hey, if I need help, I need help. You know, there's no I in team. Like when I was in the military, my team, okay, I was used to my weakness, somebody stronger in that area. You know, like when I was with my wife, okay, you know, you go off of each other because marriage is not 50 50. Okay, sometimes it's 60 40. Yeah. And you fellas know that, that you're married. Um, raising a family. You um, accidentally hit mute. Oh. And just doing the best and seek help and talking to positive men. That's what got me through the program. So I encourage any man to take the program, seek out help and move forward and just have fun with it. And I will piggyback on that and say that lots of times us as men, and especially when we have sons, you, you, you want to surround yourself with like-minded men of yourself. And, 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 and as myself, when my son was growing up, I told him all the time, you know, every man that came around, came around with you, a friend of mine that was a male that had other kids, there was like-minded of, of me. Um, not saying they was like me, but they, they had the intention. Like if, if I wasn't there, you can go to him and he's going to say the same thing to you. Not right. necessarily words, but you get the same um, meaning from, from him. And lots of times us as, as older, older men now, we have to grab those, young, those younger guys and, and do that. You know what I'm saying? Because as, as a group, they sometimes they miss that. They lack that. You know, in Marvin's case, they said dad wasn't there. You know, and it really comes for us. Like when I was coaching sports and everything, we are we are that male role model figure. As me working with the city as well and in the rec department and all the different young men that come through, we are that role model. They, they don't get a chance to see dad. They're always with mom or dad just come. I wish my dad would come. So, I mean, we, we play some vital roles as us as men when we had the opportunity to have other men that's around us. But, it, you know, we, we all got our, our Joker-type friends or Joker-type people, you know. And, and my son know that. I said, you know, hey, when we was in school, man, he used to do X, Y, and Z. You know what I'm saying? I'm not discounting what he, what he was as, as a man and as a person. But, listen, these are the men that I need you to be around. These are the men that are, that are entrepreneurs. These are the men that, that are doing things, you know what I'm saying? He's still my buddy, too. But, you know, he's still trying to find his way at 40, you know, or 25 or, 20, you know, those different ages. Nothing wrong with that. He'll find it. But but for me, to, in order to teach you, you know, and get you where you need to be at, I had to, I had to surround him around with other men that we, I can talk talk to them as men as my issues going on. They can talk back to me. And they say, man, you ought to go and do X, go do this or go do that. So I wasn't ashamed when I had to go to the court and, and get that paperwork. I wasn't ashamed when I, you know, in the WIC office and stuff when I was able to do that. It was a lot of those items I couldn't get because, as Marvin and everyone said, because I was a man and they felt, well, you don't need this. You're a man. You should be able to work and get, you know, no, nah, you don't qualify. It's like, I don't qualify. I ain't got no money when I was first. <laughs> like, no, how do I not qualify? You know, <laughs> and you go look at another mom, it's like, that. I was like, well, goodness gracious, we about in the same boat. I can't get a little something. So it just made you want to drive harder to to right. do more and get more, you know, for for yourself, you know. But like like Marvin said, I mean, sometimes a lot of things are set up because us as men, they don't expect us to need anything, so they don't come to us unless you're, I mean, unless you really like really flat down and out, you know. Then it's like, oh, well, he needs some help, you know. He, he needs to get him back on his feet, but you don't have to be flat out, down and out in order to receive help. So it just. It just really surround yourself around with good, positive people, you know, men, and reaching right. out as, as we are now to reach out to other, you know, young young brothers we see and just help them, you know what I'm saying? I mean, because we went through some stuff and we still going through stuff, so we got to help each other. You know, that's really what it boils down to. Yeah, right. And I, I think the systems as a whole need to do three things, right? The first thing is that they need to make fathers feel that they are invited in. Mm -hmm. All these systems, whether it's school, yeah whether it's social services, different networks, things like that, that they're invited in and that their, their presence there is, is valuable. The other piece of it, I think, is that they need to, every single agency, every single system needs to have some level of initiative that engages fathers as well, too, because fathers are being excluded intentionally in a lot of situations. Yeah. You know, you've got the biopsychosocial which that screening will ask you about your mother and it'll ask you about your father and all of that, but it never asks whether or not your parent is engaged, whether you are, you know, it, whether mm. you live with them, who you live with and whether the father is involved or not. 
when they know that the research says that the strategies for having a, a father involved creates a more successful human being or having both parents involved creates a more successful human being. So that's two. And then the third thing is putting together strategies that help fathers deal with trauma. You know, when you're a little mm. boy, you fall mm. down, yeah. don't you cry, get up, you know, and they expect you could walk around with a broken leg. He's all right. You know, they yeah. expect huh. fathers to, to deal with that. And, and even in my own experience and even some of the things I've been through in my own pain, even having the conversations, the deep conversations with my dad and understanding my dad dealing with the trauma of the divorce and which kept him from engaging with us, which traumatized us, which, you know what I mean? There's a level of trauma that men deal with that needs to be addressed at all of these levels appropriately. Because when you don't do that, you oftentimes just continue to feed that cycle. So those are the three things I would definitely put up. Those are good stuff, Marvin. I'm over here taking notes. Yeah, that's, me too. <laughs> that, that's good stuff. Um, any time that I've ever seen uh, any institution of any kind try to make change, I've seen them go the governmental route, uh, lobbying. Uh, and then there's the other side, I see them uh, create uh, cultural change. And this is where I think I got a chance earlier today, LaGuardia, to see some of your videos. I think that stuff is what's going to help uh, fathers be more... Um, just, just, just make it more culturally accepted, or, or everything against what we just spoke about, um, for for more people to see um, fathers involved. For example, the 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 unfortunate passing of Kobe Bryant earlier this year. All of a sudden, right. uh, you have hashtag girl that girl that, and it, it, anything that has a hashtag becomes an official movement. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. So like now, now it's an official thing. So now, 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 seeing that unfortunate event. Um, you know, as a girl dad myself, I'm feeling empowered, like, man, this is really cool. So, uh, instances and in where through social media, TV, anything else where dads are portrayed as not only involved, but competent, sadly, I, th I feel like, uh, in a lot of TV shows and, and movies as well, pro fathers as portrayed are portrayed as just comic relief for the family. They're not portrayed as the strong, reliable foundation. Um, mothers are portrayed that as well. Not that mothers aren't in real life, but I've seen in TV where fathers are just uh, the annoying, <laughs> the annoying one that's just there for comic relief. And if, if you want a serious thing done, you go to mom. Um, yeah. So I think more, more positive um, uh, uh, depictions of fathers in social media, in Hollywood, in everyday life, like the stuff that you're doing, LaGuardia, the stuff that you're putting out, just showing so that people can see, man, there's, there's followers that really care out there. Right. So I think everything that you're saying, Marvin, along with the cultural change and exposure of positive fathers will not only show the, 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 the society as a whole that fathers are more, that there are fathers that care, uh, but it'll, it'll, it'll empower those fathers that feel like they don't have a voice that man, you, there, there is really, there really is a group that can help you and, and, and right. uh, help you, help you take the next step. Yeah. You know, I was having a, a conversation with, with fathers or, or men basically in church men's war room. And we were having a conversation. We were talking about things and, 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 you know, most father, if you ask any father, I don't care where he is, what his station is, does he want to take care of his children, be involved in their lives? He'd absolutely resoundingly say, yes, I absolutely would. But then when you ask him how he can do that, that's where the roadblocks really come up. Well, I got work and I got to do this and I got to pay this child support and all the other things. And, and just helping them to be able to filter through some of that and coming up with strategies that make sense to where you could present legislation, like even the the, the, the child support system, you know, there are a lot of, the child support is based on t uh, time sharing in the sense of who has the overnight. But what would, a, if you told a dad, hey, look, if you pick your kid up after school and you feed him before you take him home or whatever, then that's time sharing and that's valuable and your child support will adjust based on that. How many fathers would be involved in that? How many fathers would be taking their kid, even if it was fixing sandwiches and whatever else, but fixing their kids' meals and spending that time 
in, in, in order because they could afford it, because they could do it. And those are the deep strategies that I'm talking about as well to really get to the heart of involvement and fathers being involved in their kids' lives. That's great, man. That is, that's just some incredibly practical sound stuff. And for, and for me, um, I mean, this is the most, this is the most, I have not talked to this many dads at once in a long time. <laughs> right. So conversations like this for me is important because that's where practical solutions like that come out. Yep. That's where people are able to share their honest experiences and you can see what needs to be done very easily just with, with uh, five of us, six of us here. Like there are solutions that could change a state, change a, it, it's just, there's so much that could be done and it makes me want to do more of this in my own life, be uh, communicating and talking to other brothers too. Cause as I said, you, you know, I'm pretty isolated in my world and I still have to break out of that thing of feeling like I can handle everything myself. So even when I first became a dad, I really wasn't looking for too many resources and different things. I found out about Wix stuff late. I was like, what's that? Like, oh, I don't have to be, oh, okay. I thought being broke, I was just broke. Like it, it was so many <laughs> things I had to learn. And, uh, and so to be in a spot where other fathers don't have to go through the same thing, I, I love being a part of that. And I would love to see more conversations like this. And I'm honored to use my platform to, uh, to promote things like this and to make a father being very involved in their kid's life a very normal thing mm -hmm. so that uh, people aren't shocked when we show up at the school uh, and they don't have to ask if we're the granddad or some other weird question they should be asking. Huh. Yeah. So, so Marvin first proposed it, and he talked about moms. How can moms and families be better advocates for fathers? Well, since I brought it up, I'll say, you know, moms <laughs> for the hun, uh, oftentimes, especially if the father is separated, the filter for the child becomes the mom. You know, I learned who my father really was. So my mom and dad divorced when I was like 10. So I learned who my father was through my mom and her pain. Mm. Mm -hmm. But when I moved in wow. with my dad when I was 16, I learned real, who my dad really was. You understand? No fault of my mom, no fault of my dad. That's just where it is. So there should be things in place um, to, to where moms are even taught how to work through that pain of separation in order to nurture the relationship between the father and to, and to give, you know, that level of esteem and access, you know what I mean? Why do you have to go to the court to have something adjusted that makes it easier for you to spend time with your kid? You know what I mean? That should be a part of the process there as well, too. Um, you know, court, family, family law systems are so adversarial now that they don't do any social good whatsoever, you know, and, and we have to get back to the heart of that. And that's just by encouraging moms and showing them the importance of placing fathers in the child's life, regardless of whether or not mom and dad are together. Right. Being honest. I mean, my, my Marv, you hit on it as being honest. I mean, it's almost like we're thinking the same way because with, with, my, with my son, I mean, differently, I never spoke any ill wills of his mom, even though we weren't together, you know, and, 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 that, re and that really speaks to volumes as far as you know, having our children, male or female, you know what I'm saying, really get to know who their parents are. Now they, now they, you know, their mom or dad might just be the worst thing, you know what I'm saying, but you speaking it, you, it's more as like you need to see it for yourself. So lots of times when my son was growing up, you know, I didn't speak any ills and he would ask the questions and stuff, you know, where's mom, where's this, you know, like, man, I, I just don't know, man. I, I just don't think she's ready, you know, ready to, to deal with everything. And it took for him as he got older and he began to see for himself and to be able to establish himself that everything I was saying, I, was, I wasn't ever saying anything negative, but himself, you know what? I'm good. You know what I'm saying? I didn't miss anything. You know, I didn't really miss anything. You know, in, in essence, you know, you think about, yeah, he missed a little something because of mom, but then he has all, you know, his, his aunts and my mom, you know, there. But, you know, you, you, you have to give that child that opportunity to, to learn and grow from their, from their, um, 
mom or dad, you know what I'm saying? So that, that, that mom also has to make sure that that child will be able to see who, who that other uh, parent is, you know what I'm saying, for themselves, because we can't tell them that, you know what I'm saying? They need to learn that for themselves, you know, and it's like the same thing, even when we're dealing with our kids, you know, we, we give them all the tools, as I said before, but they need to see for themselves what they have to do, and it's, it's the same thing in this scenario. So moms have to make sure that they give, give that child that access to see for themselves what that dad is or what that mom is for themselves because they're going to have to deal with that as they get older, you know what I'm saying? And, and not for us, well, you never told me about mom and what they did. Well, I, you know, you need to, you know, that was for you. You know, it's not for me to, to write the book. You need to write the book and see the covers for yourself. So hmm. well, I've made this statement before to a few people that I've engaged with and I'll make it now that horrible husbands can still be great fathers. Yes, just as is. much as horrible wives yeah, that's good. can be great yes. mothers. And that should be something that, that moms and dads really understand. He could have been a horrible husband to you, yeah. but he could be a great father to his children. And she may have been a horrible wife to you, but she's a great mother to those children. And being able to really reinforce that, I think, is important. Yes, I would agree. Um, so we're about to wrap up and we'll uh, propose this one question. It, do you guys, because you guys are, have varied experiences, and I think in, in, my perfect, in my career path, you know, I think one, one group of fathers that are neglected are teen fathers um, and younger fathers. So what bit of advice do you guys have for the younger fathers or new fathers? Hmm. For, for me, the biggest change that uh, I, I wasn't a teen father, but uh, we had our first daughter at 22 uh, and it was, you know, special needs daughter and, and it totally rocked our world. We weren't expecting it at all. Uh, didn't know how to handle it. The biggest thing in my life that made uh, the biggest change is men that came in my life and showed me how to be a dad. So uh, I've seen that true in every area of life, whether it's in business in ministry, in sports, in entertainment, uh, having someone, a mentor, to show you how to get to where you are not and where you want to be. So um, to, to, to advice to a teen dad or a young dad, I would say do all that you can to find uh, a father, a, a role model that can show you how to be a good dad. Uh, there's lots of things that, 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 um, that they can do, but I feel like for me, from my experience, that, was, that made the biggest difference. Uh, just finding a man that can show you how to be a good father. Yeah, I spoke I about that earlier, that, that circle of friends, you know, that circle of, you know, when, when you have those young teen fathers, they, they have to start to realize that you're a dad now. You know, saying if 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 even you play sports, basketball, or whatever, you're a dad now. You have to take on those responsibilities. So, it, it it would take on that that teen dad, you know, that teen dad's grandmother or, or mother or whoever does, you know, start putting those circle of circle of men around him to to help him to to see those things. I mean, I, I was I was just fortunate growing up that I, I had that circle of uncles and and you know and older cousins and everybody that was around me that I could see what it was supposed to be as a father. You know, even with my own father, I could see that. Um, lots of times these young dads don't, don't have that. So you, you, when you see that young dad, you know, you have to engage with them and, and, just, and just talk with them and give them some words. I mean, I, I have some different young dads at, at my job and, and I spoke to him about some different things, you know, and he, you know, related to me and said, you know, I really do appreciate when you talk with me, you know, so I said, listen, we got, we have to stick together <laughs> as men, you know, <laughs> I might not have the whole answer, but I, I know what you're going through and I know what you're about to go through and I'm going through it now because I got a young, another younger one. So it's, it's like, you have to, us as, us as men, we have to be not, we, we ain't got to talk about sports all the time. We ain't got to talk about how many girls we're going to get all the time. We, you know, it, I mean, we, 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 we got to talk about sometimes just what, what I'm feeling, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm mad or I'm pissed off or whatever, because that, that other man might be going through the same thing and give you, can give you some words in order to help ease you through. And, and, and that's where, that's where we have to be for those young dads when we see them and we know them, you know what I'm saying? To, to help be that mentor, as Dr. said, you know, you have to be that mentor for them. So it's that circle of friends and, and mentors that, that need to surround yourself around. That's, that's really good. And now what I mean, piggybacking on that, it kind of comes back to one of my flaws, right? Like I would tell them that it is okay to ask for help. And just like what you've been for those young men, uh, you do have to open up so people can even know who, who you are, that you are a dad in the first place. Looking for other dads is definitely gonna help. 
even if you're in a stage in your life where I'm 18, I want to show I'm grown, I don't need nobody, I don't prove that, you ain't got to prove nothing. Like yeah. you can, it is completely okay to get help and get support, talk to other men, and then at the same time, not to be too hard on yourself because you're going to make mistakes and that's okay. Like being a father is going to be a learning experience. Everything is not going to be perfect. But if you love that child and you're present and you're there, you are going to be able to soak in all of those lessons so much better and be a great dad. Oh, yeah. And I think being being preemptive as well, too. You know, there, there used to be a thing called home ec and some of those other things. And <laughs> <laughs> away with a lot of those things. But I think even in that, revamping it to help young men understand the responsibility that 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 being a successful father because anybody could be a father right but what are some of the things what are the strategies to be a successful father a successful father can take care of his children so if your mindset is i can't get any children here until i take can take care of them and that is your mindset then your behavior hopefully will follow that as well too i think there needs to be strategies early to talk about what is that thing that makes a successful father? Because no one talks about what being a successful father is until after you die. You're in the box, facing the ceiling. Somebody's up talking about how great a dad or how great a person yeah, you yeah. were and the whole thing. And, and, yeah. you, and to your dying day, you may never have felt that, right? So yeah. um, again, looking at what are the strategies, what are the things that make successful fathers, make great fathers? And what is that? Successful fathers are really only measured by the success of the children, right? Mm. So it has to be an integrated process right. as well. Yeah. Like that. And Derek, did you have any last words that you wanted to add? Um, basically, listen to everybody. And once again, mentoring uh, for teen fathers, because if they don't have a role model to teach them, then how are they going to teach their kids? So um, just surrounding yourself with the right people, like it was said before. And, um, you know, I'm still learning as well because I didn't have my father to teach me how to be a father. I had my uncles to teach me, and I look up to both my uncles as my superheroes, whether they know it or not. But... Um, you know, I'm just trying, striving day by day, asking God to give me the courage and wisdom to keep moving forward. Justin, I would jump, probably jump in right now and just say, uh, echo what, uh, what was already said, that one of the biggest obstacles to do anything is fear. And so fear of failure. Um, anyone, any one of those team dads could jump in right now and say, man, you guys are great dads. And I probably can speak for most, if not all of us, and say, at your age, I had no idea what I was doing either. Dear. Uh, and like, no, older than them, I had no idea. What I was no doing. clue. No clue. But we we're successful now, like you're saying, Marvin, because we we were there and we tried. Yeah. We just just show up, and and with love, like you said, Lebrady, with if if you're just there and you try, you're they're gonna grow from it, and you will see you you're gonna grow from it. I'm a better man because of my kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's right. And, and I, I want to thank all of you today for taking the time and having, expressing the message. Um, and I want to just highlight, like, what's so powerful and impactful is that you, you guys have challenged what that idea of a man is and what a father is and what strength means. Because all of you, I, in my opinion, and the work that I do, true strength is in within vulnerability. And every single one of you showed vulnerability today. And I know this message is going to really impact a lot of men going forward and a lot of fathers going forward and a lot of families. Um, and the conversation doesn't need to stop right now, you know. And I hope going forward we have keep having these conversations. Um, and I, I'm blessed to be a part of this group and to be the moderator today. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Give me the opportunity to just find out who you are and just to listen to your stories as well. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you all so much. This was amazing. Just wanted to acknowledge uh, we had a young man in the comments. His name is Nicholas Williams. He had a lot to comment about. Um, one of the things that stood out was that, Chris, you was you were his coach. And mm -hmm. when he had his first daughter and um, you, you were his example is what he said. You and Carlos were his example. Right. And so, um, and I then... Know, um, know exactly is, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we have um, Jennifer who said, um, Justin, this can be your monthly call for dads. Home Again Catholic can have yes. a monthly call for dads. <laughs> um, okay, Dowdy Do said, um, show this video to supervisors and staff in various systems, part of ongoing training. They often never think about that. So this will be a good way to start that conversation. Um, and Jennifer said she's excited to um, keep these discussions going. Pete Pedro said they had um, there were five men who were part of the Operation Par Residential Program. They were on, and they just wanted to say thank you for your discussion. It opened up some topics for their conversation. And um, everyone's just saying thank you. It was great. And then Jennifer also said that child welfare systems need to see this too. So um, it was just a pleasure sitting and listening in on the conversation. Um, thank you again to everyone for um, giving your time and just being so transparent. I think that's the part that's really important. And um, so thank you again and um, happy Father's Day to all of you all. Uh, <laughs> just in time for Father's Day. And um, any final thoughts before we uh, wrap up? I want, I want the... Uh oh. <laughs> I'm going to talk at the same time. Okay. Uh, who was saying something? Okay, so hey. I was just, I was just, I was just, I was just gonna say for fathers that want something more than a tie and underwear. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if my if my wife's listening. I've heard that since. Uh, Genevieve, did you want to say something? I wanted to say thank you to all of you guys. Um, for all of you, I emailed you or called you. A couple of you I called and said, hey, you're doing this for me. And the other, <laughs> <laughs> I reached out and emailed you multiple times. I really appreciated this. Um, like I said earlier, has been a passion of mine um, because I think fathers are important. And I think that you guys are not acknowledged as much as you are. And like, you know, many of you said, you know, you're there, you do it, and you're just not acknowledged. So I really appreciate you taking the time um, and we really got more, we got more to come. So between Justin and his dad circle and more focus on fathers, you know, we're going to continue this. Um, and so I will be reaching back out to you and hopefully we can continue this conversation um, for years to come. Okay. Great. Great. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And you